As we come to our text today, before we read it, I want to encourage you this morning to throw out your timelines. You know what I'm talking about. We all have heard, well, this is going to happen, and then this is going to happen, and then this is going to happen. That's not what we're concerned with today. We are concerned only with the text of Revelation itself. And, uh, all, and the context in which it is found in, John's intention, his audience, that is what concerns us today. And we'll see if there are any conclusions we need to draw from that as we go. So open your Bibles with me. And I'm reading from the NIV this morning, so that's the same Bible in the pew, uh, to Revelation chapter 13. And it's a fairly lengthy section. We'll be reading 13 through 14, 13, 1 through 14, 13. Let's read together the words of God. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its head, or on its horns, and each head, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, leopard, but had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like those of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne with great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world, and the whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they had worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All those names have not been written. All those names who have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. That's important. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone go, is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword they will be killed. This calls for patience and endurance. And faithfulness on the part of God's people. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because, and because of the signs, it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the, the beast, the image, to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slaves, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their forehead so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark 
which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. But the person who has, in, who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for the, it is the number of a man. The number is six, six, six. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Again, this is important. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of a harpist playing with their hearts. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. There are those who did not defile, or these are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgins. They follow, follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths, for they are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image, or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God. This is important. Keep his commands and, re and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. May God bless to our hearts this reading of his holy word. The Roman historian Tacitus gives us the following account of the reign of Nero. In AD 66, Tiridates, king of Armenia, traveled for nine months with an entourage of 3,000 horsemen to pay homage to Emperor Nero. He arrived to find Rome decorated with torches and garlands. Nero, after all, knew the value of good propaganda and had spent a huge sum on the festivities. Before dawn, thousands of spectators dressed in white and carrying laurel branches gathered in the forum. As the, as the sun rose, Nero entered. Dressed in imperial purple to sit on a throne on a platform specially built for the occasion. Tiridates processed between two flanks of Roman soldiers before kneeling before Nero with his hands over his breast. At this the crowd roared, crowd roared so loudly he feared for his life. Then Tiridates declared, Master, I am the descendant of Ar Arsac Arsaces, brother of the kings of the Volgenes and Pocorus, and your slave. I have come to you, my God, worshiping you as I do, Mithra, the sun god. The destiny you spend for me shall be mine. 
for you are my fortune and my fate. Nero replied, you have done well to come here in person, that meeting me face to face, you might enjoy my grace. For what neither your father left you, nor your brothers gave and preserved for you, this I grant you, king of, of Armenia. I now declare to you that both you and they, and they may understand that I have power to take away kingdoms and to bestow them. So what we see here is in fact that in Rome, the Caesars expected to be worshipped and revered as gods. Nero was one of the first to really lean into this supposed godhood and he was so egotistical that he demanded the worship of all people. And those who did not obey him, he killed. The same would be true to a varying degree down through the ages. Where after Nero's 42 months of persecution, from the year 64, 65 to 68 when he died, the specter of Nero and his persecutions like his would be raised whenever the empire or emperor wanted to control either the Christians or Jews or one of the other religions in the empire. Remember what Nero did to those Armenians who didn't worship him? Worship me or the same will happen to you. Nero, of course, is, is the first, like I said, from 64, 65 to his death in 68. Time also when the temple was destroyed, leading to the temp destruction of Jerusalem in 70. But Domitian, whose persecution began in 90, and who was in power when our text for today was written, was just as bad, if not worse, the Nero. As we come to our text today, I hope you're seeing some parallels between some of what we read in our text this morning and the illustration from the annals of Roman history. We need to be cautious when we come to the book of Revelation, we need to be cautious when we come to any book in the Bible. But we need to be cautious when we come to the book of Revelation. <laughs> too many have been too hasty and done damage to the text and said things that the, that the text does not say about redemptive history. Historically, there have been three primary ways this book is interpreted. The first is the preterist, who believes that it's all fulfilled in 70 when Jerusalem is destroyed. The second is the historicist, who sees the book playing out in history. And finally, you have the futurist, who sees Revelation as all about end times prophecies. And that, of course, has been the popular view in our own time period from about the year 1870, when a man named John Nelson Darby threw out the historical context and only applied Revelation to his own time period. We've been doing that to various degrees ever since. The problem is, Revelation wasn't written in our times. Nor was it written directly to us. And so, to help us interpret it, there is a combination of all three perspectives. The preterist, the historian, the historicist, and the futurist. The structure of Revelation itself actually plays into this kind of interpretation. Revelation is split up into seven sections. 
Each section starts with a event from history, something that has already happened. The second section goes into what is happening in the present time of John's writing. And the third section of each seven sections, or the third part of each seven sections, deals with what will happen, God's response to the evil taking place on the earth. And what John does in Revelation is he peels back the curtain. He peels back the curtain so you can see the spiritual reality behind current events and how, and how God is going to rectify the spiritual reality behind the current events. And, and it's written to these seven churches in Asia Minor who are the primary uh, recipients of the violence perpetrated by Nero and now Domitian in 90. This is when, when John is writing. So again, John is peeling back the curtain so you can see what the principalities and powers behind what's going on are doing and how they're acting. All of this is incredibly important to understanding our text today, which is parts two and three of one of the sections of Revelation. And this section begins with Satan, depicted as a dragon, battling a woman who is commonly understood to be the people of God. It is also, because she is uh, pregnant, she's also likely uh, the, the, to represent the Jews who would give birth to the Messiah. Jesus comes as a Jew, right? Who would raise up a new people of God. So both interpretations are actually accurate. And then as we come to our text today, we find Satan, again depicted as a dragon, standing on the shore of the sea. And from the sea rises this beast with seven heads and ten horns, with crowns and blasphemous names written all over him. He has a mortal wound that has been healed, and he's made up of various wild animals, a leopard, a lion, and a bear, which, by the way, means that the NFC North other teams... Have... No, I'm kidding. I just said you Vikings fans are on the right side of history, so anyway. The three creatures associated with three empires in the prophecy of Daniel 7, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. But he is a, a combination of all three. He's a combination of all three empires that are depicted in Daniel. And this beast comes from the sea, like the Romans would, when they arrived in Judea and Asia Minor, arrived from the sea. So again, John is giving us a spiritual picture based on his understanding of Daniel 7, which even today, by the way, we understand as a prophecy about the coming of the uh, empires that would rule Judah after Babylon. Persians, uh, or this, the uh, uh, Medes, and then the Persians, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans. Again, remember that John is peeling back the curtain to his readers, showing them what heaven is seeing in their time period. This first beast gives, or receives the power of the dragon, and he utters blasphemy against God and he's given the ability to persecute the Christians for 42 months. About three and a half years. Which, as I've already said, is how long the first persecution under Nero lasted. Those who are not believers bow down and worship it. Just as Rome has conquered the known world, this beast would have authority over all the nations, tribes, and peoples of the earth. This beast also gave you a mark so that you could not buy or sell or participate in civic life 
if you did not bow down to the emperor, and if you did, and if you did worship Caesar, you were given either a tattoo on your arm or on your forehead, or a piece of jewelry that had Nero's name written on it. One emperor, one emperor actually handed out certificates when you came to burn your incense that you would then show in the marketplace. Uh, even without a physical mark, because some emperors didn't do this, there, it was so hard to do commerce without being involved in one of the pagan trade guilds, you may as well have been involved in one of the pagan trade guilds, which, by the way, burned incense to the emperor. So take note here, because this is not something... Because this, this mark is not something you get by accident. It takes an intentional bowing down to the beast, or the emperor, or the empire, to receive this mark. You could not get it by accident, and you could not be tricked into getting it. It was quite obvious what you were doing. You were going down to the place where they burned the incense on the altar to the emperor. You were bowing down, burning that incense, saying your praises to the empire. Then you were given your stamp, and you, or you were given your certificate, or you were given your piece of jewelry. It was a very intentional act. It was a willful act of, re of worship, and the reason the Christians were being killed is because they refused to participate in this ritual. They would not bow down. Then a second beast arrives. And while the first beast rules by brute force and power, this beast, which looks like a lamb with horns and speaks with the voice of a dragon, he is the propagandist. He does signs and wonders. But he also raises the image of the first beast. In fact, the NIV uh, is actually uh, not following the Greek here when it says it had the people make a image. The Greek actually best translates the, that the lamb made an image of the beast. It raises an image of the first beast. It makes it talk. And the first beast image then, and the second beast then again, persecutes the Christian. But he does it by raising the specter of the first beast, this image of the first beast. And the message is, if you don't bow down, if you don't worship this beast, if you don't do these things, then, uh, then the persecution like Nero is going to come back. And actually, what we know from history is that there were rumors that Nero was going to return. And Domitian is said to have been one of the reincarnations of Nero. So they keep raising the specter of the brute force of the persecution of the first beast. So again, you see that there's an immediate application to things going on in John's day. There's an immediate application to what's going on in John's day. The second beast continues to persecute the Christians. They won't bow down. The beast of his imp is in and his image and the beast continues to blaspheme God. And this is when we move to the future. Now we're moving to part three. John then looks and sees a vision of heaven. We see the lamb, the true lamb, not the mock lamb that speaks like a dragon, but the lamb that was slain. And this lamb is with 144,000, a figurative number. It's not a literal 144,000. Because we're told who these 144,000 are. They're the first fruit of God on the earth. They're the Christians who believe and who have already died from the persecution of Nero. 
They're singing and praising the Lamb, and they themselves have a mark on their foreheads. This is important. They have the mark of the name of Christ and of God the Father. So the believers have their own mark. Those who bowed down to the beast have the mark of the beast. Those who didn't have their own mark. John tells us these are the people who didn't bow to the beast. The saints who are undefiled by the allure of idolatry. They've also not lied, but have, done, but have been honest. Three angels appear. The first one proclaims an eternal gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ that we are to proclaim today. The second angel proclaims the defeat of the beast calling it by the name of Babylon. This is the empire that the nations have worshipped, and it's defeated. The third declares the punishment of all who pursued the beast and bowed down to its image, eternal torment and punishment. Now, that's a lot, but really well, all I want you to draw from this is why John is saying why John is saying this. And he's very clear about why. He's not telling us what to look for. He's not telling us, uh, to, to, trying to give us a timeline. He's not doing all the things that we tend to make out of these things. He has a very specific purpose. Look at verse 10. At 13.10. If anyone go in, is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, they, they will be killed with a sword. Here's John's purpose. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the people. Now, turn to 14, 12 and 13. The second angel's words and John's words or the third, fourth angel's, third angel's words, this calls for patience, endurance on the part of the people of God who keep His commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in Christ from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. John tells us why he's writing these things. And a lot of damage has been done by ignoring John's purpose. He's writing it to encourage the saints to persevere in the middle of a difficult time. Not so that they can be afraid of the empire, but so they can persevere knowing that those who do not bow down to the beast receive the mark of the land. That those who remain faithful to Jesus have that, that mark of the Lamb and can persevere and will one day experience eternal rest. While well, those who bow down to the emperor, to the empire, will be destroyed. So in that regard, he is telling us what will come. That if we persevere, if we endure the trials put before us to endure, if we run the race, if we remain faithful to Jesus in every situation that is in front of us, then our eternal security is guaranteed. And we can endure because we do know the outcome. That's John's point. Church, many of us at the beginning of the pandemic and, and, and spent in the culture a lot longer than that, heard many preachers warning that the vaccine when developed would be a, a means to deliver to you the mark of the beast. I want you to see this for what it is. It's fear-mongering and it's foolishness. The mark of 
the beast is not something you can get by accident. It's not something you can be tricked into getting. It's not. And if you're a genuine follower of Jesus, you can't get it at all. It takes a willful act of worship of the empire or the emperor, the beast, the state, whatever you want to call it. You have nothing to be afraid of in this life. But those who tell you to beware of the mark, they're only once again creating and preying on fears. That Jesus simply says, don't have. Don't be afraid. Don't fear man. Fear God. He can destroy both body and soul in hell. Scripture is telling us not to be afraid. Don't let them. Now, at the same time, at the same time, we, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be vigilant. Because what John describes in his day still exists today. Empire is still present. And we should discern if we are living in one that rules by brute force or propaganda. One that just persecutes us or which raises the specter of persecution to get us to obey and worship it. <coughs> Church, our home is not here. It's in heaven with the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But the empires of this world want you to syncretize your faith, to justify making your faith secondary and the empire primary. This is going to be controversial, but you want to know which mark you bear? Which is more important to you? Your, your status as a citizen of America or your status as, your, as a citizen of heaven? I've said before that American citizenship is a gift. It's a blessing. It's meant to be used. It's a good thing. But it's meant to be used for the kingdom of heaven. Not the other way around. I've said, yeah, there's nothing wrong with being a citizen of a nation. But when we put the flag before the cross, in any way, in any way, we're in dangerous waters. Jesus did not save, die to save the empire. He died to save those who believe in him. And there may come a time when we have to choose here. Worship the empire or worship God. Perhaps we're already there. The Spirit knows and the Spirit will lead us into all truth. Which will you choose? As a historian, I can tell you that when we choose wrong, it never goes well for us. As a pastor, primarily as a pastor, first and foremost as a pastor, I want you to keep your eyes on Jesus. Do not be afraid of this world. Keep your eyes on Christ, and you'll never have to be. Because you know your eternal home, and you can persevere through whatever comes next. Let's talk to the Father. Lord, help. Help us have discernment. Help us have wisdom in the face of this time. We need you. We need to hear you. Lord, we think we know, but so often we find out we're wrong. So help us keep our eyes on you. 
Lord, remind us that there's nothing wrong with being the citizen of a nation. That is a good thing. That is a blessing from you. But that should never take a front seat to our citizenship in heaven. So Lord, help us discern the time before us as a people of your word. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the name of the Son.